Hello. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you to the Greenville Chamber for inviting me here today. I am a proud Gamecock, even during football season. And I'm, I'm also a proud Terrier when we play the uh, UNC. As Jenny mentioned, I got to know her well when I went through my two years in Liberty Fellowship. Honestly, the first day when I walked in the room, there weren't many people who looked like me, who were doing the things I was doing, except for Jenny, who quickly filled the void of mentorship in that moment. I think the point actually was that we were not supposed to look alike. But through her mentorship, her facilitation, and her very keen questions, we found our like-mindedness in spite of our diversity in that room. Jenny's correct. I'm the CEO of a $6.5 billion organization. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I'm a stepmother to four awesome children. I'm a member of two corporate public company boards and Wofford College board. I'm a best friend, and I'm very active in industry organizations. I'm the primary caregiver to a father who suffers from dementia. I'm a sister, I'm an aunt, I'm a niece, and I'm an investor in several emerging female-led businesses. And in all these things, I am imperfect. In fact, there's not one place I could tell you I'm perfect, except for the consistency of imperfection. <laughs> and I feel really confident in that statement. Today, I was asked to speak about leadership, and more importantly, how women can develop into great leaders. I have found, though, it is most important to start with giving each of us permission to be imperfect to discover our strengths and acknowledge our weaknesses. If we are armed with this and continuously and confidently put ourselves in positions of discomfort that push us to grow and develop our strengths and learn how to compensate for our weaknesses, we will continue to grow and create opportunities not only for ourselves but all of those around us. Several years ago, when Hewlett Packard was trying to figure out how to get more women into top management positions, a review of their personnel records found that women working at HP applied for promotions only when they believed they met 100% of the qualifications listed for the job. Men, on the other hand, were happy to apply when they thought they could meet 60% of the job's requirements. This is true data and study. At HP, in the study after study that's come out since, the data confirms that underqualified and underprepared men don't think twice about going for it, while many overqualified and overprepared women are holding back, waiting to be tapped on the shoulder and asked to take a job, thinking eventually someone will notice me. Many, many women feel confident only when they feel they are perfect. I'm here to tell you, go for it. Well, not me. I've learned to feel comfortable in discomfort. In fact, discomfort has become my comfort zone. And because of this, here I am 28 years later at the same firm. And really, who does that anymore? Learning each and every day, growing as a person, adding new intellect and content to not only myself, but my team and organization. Because I'm not afraid to put myself in positions to challenge me. Places where I don't feel confident. Places where I'm not the expert. This clearly keeps you humble, but most importantly, it's where growth happens. Let me share a secret. I don't really believe in female leadership any more than I believe in male leadership. I believe the very best organizations and the most successful organizations have gender balanced diverse leadership. And an absolute pet peeve of mine is when somebody asks, 
what's it like to be a female CEO? I have no idea how to compare being a female CEO to a male CEO. <laughs> I actually only have the experience of being a female CEO. I think the actual work of leadership is the same, regardless of whether you're a man or a woman. You have to set a purpose and a vision, build cultural guardrails, foster a sense of teamwork, and make tough calls, all while inspiring trust from your employees, your investors, your board members, your peers, and your customers. I happen to agree with Adam Bryant, the New York Times writer. We need to give a rest to the narrative about whether men or women lead differently. This trope seems past its expiration date to me. But it is imperative that we keep talking, we keep writing, we keep having conversations about why there are so few women in the top ranks. And we need to be intentional, bringing others along with us. I do think we saw some encouraging results on Tuesday with 98 women winning election or re-election making the number 100 women in the U.S. House. We saw nine female, these are huge numbers. The House will now be a 23% female. We have nine women winning state governor's elections and 12 women winning U.S. Senate seats for a total of 24 women who will be serving in the Senate. Personally, I want more Republican women to also be running next year, not because I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat, but I think the strength of this company to have female leadership on both sides of the aisle will be incredible. What, what I don't understand, though, having said that, is we're not seeing the progress in the business world. We're not seeing the progress in Fortune 500. We still have more Fortune 500 CEOs named John than we have female CEOs. And here, it's true. And here's the part I really don't understand and Minor went right to it. All of the data, all of the data shows that diversity on boards and diversity on C-suites, and that doesn't mean one woman. I by myself am not diverse. I need two, I need three women in that room. But all of the data shows the results of higher profits, higher returns, when you have diversity in that room. And I would think in this world, in this time when businesses are in a hyper-competitive world, we would do anything to give ourselves an advantage. And why is it an advantage to have diversity in our leadership? Diversity is so much more than gender or the color of our skin. Diversity is experience and thinking and, and education. When you gather diversity around the table that is not only present, but empowered to ask questions and share their thoughts and their ideas and poke holes at processes and propose solutions, that's when true innovation starts to occur. So remember, you're going to work really hard. You're going to distinguish yourself, and then the big moment will happen. And you'll be invited into the room where important and strategic decisions are being made. When you get there, find comfort in your discomfort. Don't be satisfied just to be present. Scooch right up to the table, lean in, and find your voice. Our first natural instinct, my first natural instinct, when I got a seat at the table, was to be slightly intimidated. Nobody looked like me. And I wanted to look and sound like everyone else. And I had to fight it. Don't do it. Find comfort in your discomfort. Embrace your imperfection by clearly focusing on your strengths. You're in that room because they need diversity of thought. Speak what is really on your mind. Ask the question that you think is really silly, you're almost embarrassed to ask. Let yourself be vulnerable. 
And what you will learn is you just help the group find the best answer. You ask the obvious question that nobody could see. You questioned why they picked a solution or a method, and the truth is because that's the way it's always been done because this is how they've done things and just never thought to question it. Your voice, your unique thinking, just led to a better solution, an innovative new way to do things that is truly distinguishing. And guess what? Your discomfort just shifted into confidence. Beyond diversity, though, a second reason why it makes sense to have women in leadership roles around the globe People want leaders with feminine qualities. Something I learned reading, the study, reading and studying the Athena Doctrine, which was published five years ago in 2013, the Athena Doctrine was based on research done by two social strategists who interviewed over 64,000 people around the world. First, they surveyed over 30,000 people to gather data on 200 traits and whether they associated them with being male, female, or neutral. And then they went to another 30,000 people, and they asked them to rank these traits for leadership, happiness, um, and success. But in looking at leadership tra traits, what happened over and over again, overwhelmingly, eight out of the top 10 traits associated with strong leadership were feminine. Eight out of 10 traits were considered feminine. They wanted leaders who were expressive, who had vision, who were reasonable, loyal, flexible, collaborative, intuitive, and patient. All leadership strengths associated with women. Two, str two, straight, two traits skewed more masculine, divisive and resilient. The, the third reason that we definitely need some radical leadership is that we need radical policy change throughout our entire society. Until women have a seat at the table working with and alongside men with the confidence in their own voice, we'll not have the policy change we need. Policy that changes the culture within our workplaces policy that changes how we compensate and who we invest in, or policy changes of how we source product. Really, the policy itself that we could focus on, I could talk about, isn't the point. Women need to have this stature and the confidence to use their platforms of leadership to change policy. The, our, our society is begging for it. So how do we find our confidence to lead? For me, I truly give credit to my incredible grandmothers and in playing competitive sports, as Jenny referred to, growing up. I did, I grew up outside of Chicago with parents who both had equally strong mothers. My father's father died at the age of 36 when my father was just six, leaving him and his sister to a single immigrant woman with no formal education. My mother was the daughter of a father struck with polio during World War II, leaving her mother two very young children to find their way across the country to, nur to nurse a completely paralyzed husband father. My grandmothers could have been named Athena. They, they had to bring their traits of decisiveness and resilience to the table because they had no male counterbalance. They were no-nonsense, compassionate, gritty, savvy, courageous warriors who were never stripped of their dignity, humor, or pride as they entered into strategic warfare with a society that was built for the men to be head of the household. They faced life's battles to raise their children, financially support their families, and put education first and foremost. Knowing their stories and seeing the results of their hard work in my parents, who was I to ever tell them I was lacking confidence to do anything? Additionally, playing competitive sports 
taught me a lot about failure. I was a ranked tennis player and I played field hockey at a very elite level. When you win a tennis match, you most likely have lost several points, and in some cases games and sets, on your way to victory. You clearly make unforced errors, mistakes, failures, but when you dwell too long on these failures, that's when you lose the match. When you accept the failure and quickly correct, and then move through and focus on winning the very next point, that's when success comes. So for me, when I entered the work world, everyday small failures were very much a part of who I was. I was equipped to accept failure, understand the why, and learn from what I did wrong, and quickly move on. I watch women in the workforce today, and so many do not have the skill. They're nervous to fail. Failure is imperfection. And they are thinking they're supposed to be perfect. So they never reach and they never go for it. Another secret, I journal my failures. Almost every morning I get up, I get up early. I've always been an early riser. And the, I like to write down the things I did wrong the day before and what lessons I learned. I know that if I go through an entire day without a small failure along the way, I'm not pushing myself hard enough. I'm not learning, I'm not growing, and I'm not bringing the best to the office, to my family, to my boards. If I make mistakes without admitting and learning, then I'm reckless, and I create chaos by repeating the same mistakes over and over again. And guess what? This does not inspire trust. And slowly your followers fall away. And you cannot lead if you do not have followers. So for me, though I did not walk into Edens and become the anointed leader, I walked into Edens as an analyst, about as low on the totem pole as you could be. And as I look back on my career, there were four really distinct periods or moments that have been defining for me and culminated in my ability to be a successful leader. I started at Edens in 1990, straight out of the university. This was a great time to enter real estate. The previous year, Hurricane Hugo had ripped through the state of South Carolina and had significantly damaged about 30 of our assets. As a country, we're in the middle of the SNL debacle and the RTC had become our largest lender. And Revco, our second largest tenant, had just filed bankruptcy. But everything I owned fit in the back of my hatchback, so I had nothing to lose and everything to learn. Being a good Midwestern girl, I was an early riser, and quickly I figured out that Mr. Edens, Joe Edens, who was our founder, would get to the office every morning between 5 and 5.30. Unlike me, he had everything to lose. Everything he owned was at risk in those moments. Nobody else was at the office then, so I would always try to take advantage of meeting him at the coffee pot. I planted some just coincidental moments. <laughs> Women are savvy. He would ask, what, he would ask me about what I was working on, why I was there so early in the morning. I would clearly make my projects seem a little bit bigger than they were. I would tell him what I was working on, but more importantly, I would ask him questions. I'd ask him if he had time to sit and, and give me some insights. And he actually loved these moments. They were the happy times of his days. They were filled without stress and it gave him joy to be a mentor and to be a teacher. I asked questions about everything. I wanted to learn the business from every single aspect, why we did the things we did, and pretty soon that turned into him asking me if I would take on a project. Take on this project, take on that project, and I went for it, and I didn't say no to anything. I was present, I was desperate to learn, and I volunteered for anything that was put in front of me. I even once got one of his son's best friends out of jail. <laughs> There's nothing I said no to. 
And through this, though, what I learned was it gave me opportunity to be exposed to our entire business, but it also gave me opportunity to network and to meet a lot of people I wouldn't otherwise have met. So by 1996, just six years after I graduated from college, he asked me one morning if I would be willing to lead the recapitalization of the company. Really? I said yes immediately, and then I went to my office, shut the door, and called my father and asked him what it meant to recapitalize the company. <laughs> and believe me, at that point, I wasn't even close to 60% ready for this one. But I worked harder than anyone else. I worked really hard, and we were successful in pulling off the recapitalization of the company. And after we closed the transaction, we now had what to us was an unthinkable amount of capital to grow this $250 million company. And I sat in the room, but I wasn't invited to the table when the decision was being made as to who should be the chief investment officer and drive the growth strategy of the company. All the men were at the table. All the men were talking about me like I wasn't sitting there, saying how I was not ready for the responsibility, I was young, I was a female, I was Southern, and finding comfort in my complete discomfort in the room, I finally stood up not waiting to be tapped on the shoulder, and looked them all straight in the eye and said, yes, I accept the chief investment officer job that you're trying to talk yourself out of offering me. Thank you, and I'm going to get my new business cards immediately. <laughs> and from that moment in 1997, until 2002, so for five years, I put my head down and I was singularly focused on being the very best deal transaction person. I didn't try to do multiple things. I focused on this job. I knew I had a great opportunity and I needed to take advantage of this moment. I was probably the most prolific acquirer of retail real estate in the country during this time. And looking back, what I really learned was I was focused on building a track record of success. When you focus on building a track record of success versus trying to climb the corporate ladder, opportunities open up to you. People continue to bet on people they perceive as successful. I was continued to give opportunities and success begat success. The other thing that was happening was I was building my own confidence through each transaction. Thanks to many male mentors in 2002, my success was recognized with a promotion to president and chief investment officer, solidifying my role as the number two, where I was really comfortable. In 2006, though, something really magical happened. The world was flowing with capital, capital for real estate developers like us to continue and build and grow, and capital for all the public retailers to continue to open new stores. But as I was journaling one moment, I had an aha. We're going and blowing and doing things the way we always had, the way everybody else was. We were all going after the same retailers, building projects, large town halls that all looked alike, and by necessity, because of their size, were located far distance from the customer's base. This all seemed wrong to me, because does anybody remember what was happening in 2006? Broadband entered more than 50% of the households in the US, and at the same time, Women were continuing to work outside the home at record numbers, and they were starting to become the breadwinners for their families. Today, 44% of households are headed by females who are the breadwinner. But in 2006, this was still unusual. So women who were still driving north of 80% of all retail decisions were busier than ever, 
and now had relatively easy, there's still dial-up, but relatively easy and convenient access to the internet. I sat down, Indian style, on home plate, refusing to play ball. I had a much different intuition and understanding than anyone else around me. I was that woman. I was our ultimate customer. The men in our industry and the men in my life did not intuitively feel this shift the way I did. But because I had established a success record for myself, I had established a place of confidence, they listened. I can remember going into our CEO's office and saying confidently in my discomfort, something's not right. I believe we need to look at, relook at everything we're doing and here's why. And this is when I entered into a phase of my career that I refer to as a thought leadership phase. I transitioned from just being successful at doing and transacting, but truly leading, thinking, and vision. As it turned out, we strategized. We became net sellers in 2006 and 2007. We deleveraged our company, and we totally rethought our go forward strategy. We knew change was coming, and we had to prepare. We just had no idea that the change was actually a cliff, but regardless, we were prepared. So during this time, I wrote a ton on the purpose of retail and our places. We totally repositioned what we did, how we did it, and most importantly, why we did it. We came out of the recession as a purpose-driven organization, changing our culture and becoming recognized as one of the most innovative and successful companies in our entire industry. I completely engaged and rode the thought leadership part of my career until 2013. And then I had what feels like my fourth major career moment, which I refer to as finding executive leadership. It is the time where I found my voice in the boardroom and really found my confidence in my own convictions. I found comfort in my discomfort of not looking for or thinking or communicating like everyone else. In 2013, we were in the market to monetize out our original partner from 1997 and raise an additional $750 million of growth capital. So basically, a billion and a half dollar transaction. I was focused on executing on our portfolio and operations, and our, C our then CEO and CFO were running point on this transaction. They would call me in for certain pitches, which basically entailed they would put together a great pitch book and tell me exactly which slides I was assigned to and give me my script of what to say. Our company had a great track record. They would start every pitch just like everyone else in our industry by going through the charts and the graphs of our track record, which were distinguishable. Though our numbers were, were great, we looked like everyone else, we spoke like everyone else, and this was not an everyday transaction. This was a billion and a half dollar transaction that would take something distinguishing. So we weren't making great progress. Finally, one day, several months into this, we're sitting around the boardroom, and I found comfort in my discomfort. I suggested that we shake things up. I could lead the meeting by telling our why, why we did what we did. Lead with our purpose and our mission to enrich community. Forget the numbers. Let's tell them our purpose and how we execute through design, merchandising, and engagement. Crazy things to talk about when you're in Wall Street. There's no other person in the halls of Blackstone who talked the way we talked. We talked about mission, we talked about purpose, and we talked about values. I would tell the story that differentiated us, give our purpose and our mission, and the way of executing. And after I would tell the story, the CEO, the CFO would scooch right up to the table and they'd follow with all the numbers and charts and the graphs. But this time those numbers felt different. 
they felt stronger, they felt distinguishable. It was just a little tweak in how we were presenting the story of Edens, but all of a sudden, we had multiple bidders at the table bidding out one another to, to execute on a billion and a half dollar transaction. It's a little bit more to the story than that, but basically, it was this tweak of moving from how everybody talks in the business world about numbers and about values to purpose and mission. For me, that's when I shifted. I shifted from being a thought leader to true executive leadership. Shortly thereafter, I was named CEO of Edens. And when I look back on the themes of leadership, they're not female and they're not male. As I move from every part of my career, where I humbly and aggressively learned all I could, worked harder than anyone else, and volunteered for any and all assignments. Through that, I found something I could truly focus in on and built a significant track record of success. And as success begot success, opportunities continued to unveil themselves to me. I felt more confident, and the confidence developed within me. It was this confidence that allowed me at the right moment to transition from building a track record of success to finding my voice, to becoming a thought leader within our company and industry. Clearly defining a purpose and mission for our organization which inspired people to follow. And then I transitioned into executive leadership by finding a clear, articulate voice in the boardroom where major decisions and strategy were being formulated. I had the confidence to not only share a purpose and a mission, but a vision. A vision for prosperity, inclusive prosperity for our employees, our communities, our retail partners, and finally, for our investors. I think we're all born with the qualities of leaders, but I think like most everything else, these qualities have to be honed and developed. We need mentors along the way to help us in finding our confidence and honing our strengths. People who help us find confidence in our discomfort so that we can develop our voices and truly lead by communicating a clear vision and creating a culture where diversity of thought is empowered. For me, early on in my career, these mentors were men many of whom are still very much a part of my inner circle. But as my career developed, there were several women who became sponsors. A slight tweak, but a sponsor does more than give advice and give guidance. A sponsor puts their own reputation on the line to help create opportunities for you. Both of the corporate boards that I sit on are as a result of female sponsors putting my name out there and standing behind it. To this day, I try to maintain the habit of asking questions, just like the earliest days in my career. It drives some people absolutely nuts, but I have this insatiable appetite to learn how people are thinking. I've tried to remain open and curious about how everything works and how they can how things can be made to work better. But without my network of mentors and sponsors, I would not be where I am. If you don't have a mentor or a sponsor, why not? If you have a little experience, are you a mentor or a sponsor? If not, why not? Today, I'm truly inspired by many conversations happening in the business community with men and women at the table together speaking to better cultures, better ways to invest. I'm inspired by the women putting themselves out there and running for public office. I'd also like to mentor more Republican women. I talked about that. It's important, we need women on both sides. I'm inspired by a lot of great men I'm surrounded by and mentoring and teaching of women who need their insights if they're gonna fill their roles. Together, we'll build a world where leadership is gender balanced, diversity is a given, and innovation and creativity are routine results. 
So in closing, I would say embrace your imperfection. Embrace your imperfection by focusing on your strengths and understanding your blind side. We all have them. Focus on your current role and build a track record of success that will create opportunities and grasp those opportunities. Never quit learning. You'll also build your confidence and continue to develop your strength and leadership skills by embracing moments of discomfort. Place yourself in positions that challenge you. Use your platform of leadership to intentionally change and improve policy. And finally, be a mentor, be a sponsor. If we want diverse leadership, we need to be a part of bringing on that next pool of talent.